from now about really, we're going to start recording the Zoom. Um, we do that so that anyone that can't attend today can watch the, the virtual coffee morning on our YouTube channel. So if you're not comfortable with being recorded, just turn off your video and that way um, we can't see your um, face on the screen. So that's no problem. As you will already have noticed, we do mute everyone. And that's just to keep the, um, sort of the coffee morning flowing really nicely and so that we can hear our speakers. But please um, know that later when we do sort of question and answer, um, of course, we'll um, let you unmute yourself so that you can ask your question. You can also post comments, questions and feedback via the chat facility. And you will have the opportunity to ask those questions that you put in the chat later. And we do really encourage you to ask questions. So please feel free. It is important that you do not, however, post any links or images. Um, that's just to keep everyone in this meeting really safe. So if you do post any links or images, we will remove you from the meeting. And then just a reminder that we are active on social media. So you can follow us on um, ARCC LTD. And that's on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. And if you do go to our YouTube, you can see all of our other virtual coffee mornings that we've been doing, well, I don't know, for like five, six months now. So that's really good. So I'm going to take you through our agenda. So if Mamun, can you just share the agenda on the screen for us? Brilliant. So yes, yeah, so I've done my housekeeping, luckily for you guys. Do a quick introduction and then um, we've got three speakers with us today. Um, two of them will be talking together, presenting together, and then um, Dr. Rao will be talking at the end. And like I said, the Q&A is our favourite part, so please do feel free to ask questions. And then we'll have a presentation about our expert patients programme. And then of course, our mini raffle where three of you will win um, a mini coffee hamper that we'll post to you and then just give you the dates of our next events. So today's virtual coffee morning um, is about stress awareness and April is actually stress awareness month as well. So it felt pretty appropriate to do this event today. And um, obviously we are aware that most people do feel stressed sometimes and some people can find this stress actually really helpful or even motivating. But sometimes stress can negatively affect us um, and there are things that we can try to help and we have some amazing speakers who are going to be able to help us work those things out today. Um, but it is important to remember that support is always available if you are finding it hard to cope with stress. Um, it can cause many different symptoms, it might make you feel different physically, mentally or change how you behave. And because there's so many different symptoms, it can be difficult to recognize when stress might be the reason that you are feeling or acting differently. So um, our speakers today will help us recognize some of the signs of stress. And please do remember, there's loads of things we can do to try to help with stress. And always, um, you know, give yourself permission and try to talk about your feelings to a friend or a family member or a health professional. Put time aside for yourself. Um, you know, use techniques like time management techniques to help you take control. You can, of course, use calming breathing exercises, use planning ahead and use peer support. Um, but I'm not going to be talking too much more about that because um, I would like to start today with um, basically Claire and Matthew. So they're going to be talking to us together today, which is brilliant. Um, so Claire is a peer recovery trainer with SLAM. And Matthew is an RMN and practitioner trainer with SLAM. And they both work with the Recovery College. Um, the recovery is about a personal journey towards a meaningful and satisfying life, towards living as well as possible, whatever symptoms or difficulties are present. Their workshops and courses run by the Recovery College aim to provide the tools to make this happen they help you to become an expert in your own recovery or that of someone you care for. The Recovery College is supported by the Maudsley Charity and it offers a learning approach that complements the existing services provided by SLAM. So welcome Claire and Matthew. I hope that you guys are happy to talk for 15 minutes sort of about stress awareness for us. Yes, thank you. Thanks for having us. And um... We can share the slides now, Claire, if you're ready. Yep. We've got some slides to share. <clears throat> there we go. Yeah. 
Uh, hopefully, uh, can everyone see that? Yes, we can see, Matthew. Oh, so, um, we're going to talk about stress awareness and prevention, in particular, an Ayurvedic approach. So, what is stress? Um, there's actually no medical definition of stress. And um, in many languages, there isn't actually a translation for the word stress. So it makes us think, is stress a Western thing? And this man, who's a psychologist, Langani, um, said that. Thanks, Claire. So um, from an Ayurvedic perspective, approach, um, when stress causes problems, it can be recognised in terms of unmada. So, um, I'm currently just so you know, I'm currently um, also a student at Kalenia University in Sri Lanka, where I'm I'm, I'm doing a master's in Buddhist Ayurvedic counselling. So, some of this uh, knowledge is from that, but also from previous uh, qualifications in Ayurveda. So, um, so anyway, so from an Ayurvedic approach, when stress causes problems, it can be recognized in terms of unmada. So this term unmada is a, it's a kind of umbrella term for when we experience an unsettled mind in various ways. So stress can be understood as an early warning sign or a very subtle form of unmada. And this term unmada is sometimes translated in different ways, but on the very subtle level, this is when stress starts to become um, unhelpful to us. So stress and unmada are recognized as arising due to the aggravation of vata, which is strongly connected with the qualities of vayu, which is wind-like qualities within our body and mind. So if you imagine um, um, like wind-like qualities to do with movement, lightness, and this would be related to like thinking too much so there's like lots of movement in the mind lots of thinking restlessness our body might be quite restless tension in the body lots of holding and and those kind of experiences so what we're going to do is like look at the um how we might experience stress comparing on the one side on the left side you're going to see what the nhs website says about what the different symptoms or experiences associated with stress are recognized as and on the right hand side we've got um the kind of experiences associated with unmada according to classical ayurvedic sources so these are texts that date back around over, over two thousand years to um this, this the charaka samhita you may have heard of charaka samhita um shushruta and um Ashtanga Hridaya, these are the main texts that we've used. And we just looked at Unmada and the kind of things that are mentioned associated with, with these, these with Unmada, and then comparing that with what the NHS talk about when they're talking about stress, which is really interesting. So hopefully we can just share some of that now. So I think it's fascinating how similar, you know, modern day experiences of stress are to these experiences of stress from thousands of years ago. So some of you might recognize some of these. Um, for me, for example, I, I get chest pain and a fast heartbeat. Um, and in Ayurveda, they say oppression of the region of the heart. So it's, um, it's, it's very similar. And stomach problems like indigestion or churning sensation or feeling in the body. Um, do you want to mention any of these in particular, Matthew? Yeah, there's, um, yeah, I suppose headaches is, is really common. And sometimes I hear people say, oh, I don't get stressed, but I keep getting these headaches. And actually, stress doesn't have to be something in like in mind. It's often in our, in our body. So we might experience some physical pain in the headaches and, and, and some of these ones listed here, um, emptiness in the head, vertigo. I just find it. I just find that really interesting. I mean, this 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 tells you the references in the Charaka Samhita, Ashtanga um, Samgraha, and these various Ayurvedic sources um, from this ancient tradition from India. And um, these things have been recognised, and we all experience them. We might maybe think of them in different ways, but we all experience them. And some of the ways to resolve them are common as well, which we're going to look at. So, so that's to do with the body. And some of us as well, I think in, in, in so different cultures, people might experience stress in different ways as well. So often um, 
in certain um, communities, we might experience more physical things, and, and in other communities, people might experience more uh, mental aspects. And, and, and both of these aspects are mentioned in the Ayurveda sources as well. So we've got um, difficulty concentrating, and, um, and, and that's from the NHS website. And then we've got um, fickleness of mind, distracted thinking, unsteadiness of the mind. Um, feeling overwhelmed is another one there, like another common, common one. And it's not, not exactly matching, but exhaustion and becoming moody and brooding for a long time. So that would be what I would understand to be like closely linked to feeling overwhelmed. And I think that constantly worrying is a bit yeah. is a big one for a lot of people. And again, it's so similar, disproportionate worry, loss of peace of mind, always anxious and upset. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't know that these experiences weren't written in the modern day. Yeah. Um, which is really interesting. Mm. Okay. It's, just, it's tricky to change the slide, to be honest. If I do that, that's it. You go ahead, Clara, share some of these. Um, okay, so behavioural changes, maybe drinking or smoking more, um, avoiding certain places or people, eating too little or too much. So in Ayurveda, that would be voracious eating, loss of desire or an aversion to food, emaciation, disgust. Um, sleep. Sleep is often affected when we're stressed, either too much sleep or not being able to sleep at all. And again, in the Ayurvedic text, we've got excessive sleep, habitually sleeping by day, etc. Mm -hmm. And irritability, um, I think, is quite common as well. I think some of these are what we we associate with stress most, more than physical symptoms. I don't think everyone always considers the physical symptoms in the same way as they do the behavioural. Mm. Maybe because it might be unclear that those physical symptoms are associated with stress. So you've got, what do we say, the, the um, physical changes, uh, oh sorry, the physical experiences, the mental experiences and these behavioral changes that we can experience with, with stress. And it's about like we're talking about stress when it's, um, when it's, it's becomes unhelpful. But I think earlier on, we, we we mentioned about how sometimes when we think of stress, it's it's understood as a, as a quite a useful thing at times. It's uh, it's this is how it tends to be presented as something that that gives us that that extra motivation. So for example, if, if we've got a deadline and we need to meet it, we've got that additional kind of um, it's like an energy in a way. Um, we've got that, but but this is where it becomes uh, unhelpful. So. So this is when we're, when we're talking about unmada, we're talking about these unhelpful, unhelpful aspects. So what causes stress? So we're all unique. I think that causes of stress can be different for everybody. Um, can be related to background and culture. And also our culture shapes the type of stresses we are likely to experience and the appraisal of the stressfulness of a given event. So the NHS website is very, very useful for this if you want to look up something afterwards. Um, so they say that work can be quite a big generator of stress, like pressure or unemployment or retirement. Family can be very stressful as well. And finances, money, money causes much worry for a lot of people and health or losing someone, a bereavement. In my sense is that these, these, these probably apply to all of us. Mm, That's my impression. We've all got these things in our lives and we can't really get away from them. So I'll talk about this uh, the, from an Ayurvedic perspective now about what causes stress. So in general terms, Unmada is caused by, according to the early sources, um, the overuse, underuse, or abuse of sense objects. So this is anything that we experience through the eye, ear, nose, um, taste, etc. All the different five senses, and also in Ayurveda, we we think of the mind, 
as a as a kind type of sense sense organ because thoughts are are recognised as sense type a type of sense object. But yeah, these these are all things that we can have too much thinking, not enough thinking, or just thinking about things that are not useful to us. So that's overuse, underuse, and abuse of of sense objects. So this could be also anything we experience through the senses that's in excess, like something that's too hot, too cold, etc. So um, you know, or we might have not enough sunlight or too much bright light, etc. So you get hopefully you get the sense of that one, and then karma or actions. So this is to do with our actions um, in various ways, and then time or kala. So and then so sense objects would be unsuitable sense contact, and I can't actually read this. This is these are Sanskrit terms. Um, I'm not going to try that one. It's a bit long for me. But yeah, sense objects um, that are unsuitable, um, sen unsuitable sense contact, violation of good judgment, prajna, prajna parada, or panya parada. So this is the meaning of uh, violation of good judgment. When we're going against what we deep down we know is suitable, we and, but we still do the unsuitable thing. We kind of um, ignore our own uh, integral kind of wisdom. So our actions are not suitable. And this can be a cause of, of, of unmada stress, or also all kinds of other illnesses as well, according to Ayurveda. And this one's interesting, is um, to do with climate changes or unsuitable use of time. So this could be um, when it relates to the seasons as well. So, I mean, I've noticed over the last few days, we've had a sunshine day and then we've had snow. It's just chaos. And that would be classified as this uh, myth ya yoga so it's it's this kind of disruption of, of the of this of the season but sometimes it could be that the summer is just so 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 hot and that's going to stress people out people start getting headaches sweating they can't work because it's too hot etc trying to get fans and everyone's clamoring for fans you know so that's when it's just excessive heat or winter that's too cold these things can 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 cause stress as well so there's some examples so these are the general themes of, of what causes stress in the Ayurvedic view. And I'll go on to this, um, how to deal with stress now. So again, like our culture can affect our choice of coping strategies in any given situation. Um, so we're trying to be aware of the cultural aspects. And um, there's, there's something called the four immeasurables and um, also known as the Brahma Viharas. So the dwellings of Brahma. And, and these are, Maitri or metta, which is um, loving kindness. So be kind to yourself. These are uh, key things. Being kind to ourselves, loving kindness to ourselves, also to others. And then showing compassion for ourselves, karuna. Um, really important. Remembering to take joy in the success and happiness of others, mudita. So well, also this is mudita is translated as uh, empathic joy so um when someone has a success we can we can feel happy for them so this is a good thing it lifts our mood makes us happy and the fourth one is um just finding and returning to our place of inner balance upeka upeksha so the pali is upeka upeksha is the um sanskrit term and and sometimes this word is translated as um equanimity so these are like, I mean, these take time to develop and it's always recommended we start with uh, loving kindness as a foundation for all the others. So we need, we need um, Metta or Maitri as the foundation for all these other aspects. So, so if, if not, nowhere else, one, hopefully one thing to remember is, is loving kindness, how to be kind to ourselves and to practice that. I think I can hand over to you now, yeah, Claire? Okay, so thinking about how we deal with stress, perhaps setting achievable targets, trying not to take on too much, making lists, I, I think that's particularly helpful, and taking breaks is important, and establishing an Ayurvedic daily routine, Dhyanachara, which could include cleaning your face, protecting your eyesight, drinking water, 
getting up early, oil massage, regular bowel movements or exercise. So all important components of a routine. Thanks, Claire. I don't think we've got a summary, but hopefully and we've got, we're gonna have time for questions, I think. And I'm not sure how long we've taken. I'm not sure if you know, Claire, but yeah, we, we had 15 minutes and I guess that was about 15 minutes. So thanks everyone for listening. Thank thanks, you. Claire. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Matthew and Claire. That's that's brilliant. I, I really, um, it was really interesting to see it sort of from that perspective, because I think uh, mostly when I hear about stuff, it's from the Western perspective, uh, mm. you know, just stress or whatever. And actually, it was really sort of, it made things make a bit more sense, actually, which I really appreciated. Um, so thank you. We will definitely have questions for you. Um, so yeah, please stick around, um, Claire and Matthew, because um, I know that I feel very selfish, but I'm like, I've got a hundred questions already. <laughs> so I will try to resist asking questions and let obviously our participants ask. Um, so I'm really, really excited to, to um, introduce our second speaker. So, um, and I think I can see him brilliant. So Dr. Manish Rao, he's our second speaker today. Um, he is the consultant psychiatrist and lead cl clinician for Croydon Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services. Um, so that's a long, long name. So Croydon Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services is the NHS service basically that assess and treats young people with emotional, behavioural or mental health difficulties. So welcome today. Um, are you able to speak sort of on the effects of stress on our mental health, but also on how it affects our children and sort yeah. of our adolescents as well? Absolutely. I'm hoping you can hear me all right. We Perfect. don't use Zoom so much. Um, I did put together a little, uh, a little presentation, so I'll try and share my screen as well, just to, I'm hoping you can see that. Yeah, great. Oh, so right, so that's helpfully right at the beginning. So let me go back to the start. So yeah, um, nice to meet you all. Good morning. Uh, my name, as Lizzie said, I'm, so my name is Dr. Manish Rao. I'm consultant in Croydon Cams. And we do see young people um, who are 18 and below uh, who present with, you know, diagnosable mental health difficulties. But um, we also have a lot of arms to our service, which are looking at trying to to do sort of early detection of, of, of difficulties to prevent actually um, mental health difficulties developing for young people. Um, and I think, you know, when I, was, when I was thinking about stress as a whole, I think the first thing I wanted to sort of mention was that actually stress is not always a bad thing. Um, we talk about stress being something that is a, a really negative, and I don't know how familiar people are with this with this curve it's it's called a yerkes dodson curve it's basically looking at actually some element of stress in our lives is important and it can act as as a real motivator for us to get to our peak performance when we're trying to achieve an activity or revising for i mean when thinking about young people when they're revising for exams or, or things like that so you know i think the first message is it's not always a terrible thing there's an element of stress that is actually valuable for us and um, enables us to achieve the things that we would want to be achieving now it gets to a certain point where we're we're trying to reach to a, an optimum level where you know our stress levels are, are at a point where you know we're able to achieve what we want to and we're working at peak performance i guess it becomes more of a problem when it moves into the to the red area that you see in this in this graph of stress um creating in, in increased anxiety difficulties or impairing someone's performance really um, and I think you know for young people this is by no means extensive at all but you know many of the stresses <clears throat> that we heard about in Claire and Matthew's talk are really applicable for young people too I mean obviously with some exceptions things like finances and so forth aren't necessarily as immediately uh, impacting for a young person but even prior to coronavirus you know, the stresses that our young people have been under for me has been increasing um, for various reasons whether that's um, because of increasing demands that are placed on them whether that's because of uh, their own feelings of self-worth or feelings that they might have about their appearance or the exam pressures and stresses that young people are having um, 
or you know things like bullying or peer relationship difficulties and certainly whilst there are lots and lots of positives around social media in terms of helping young people connect with each other in ways that they perhaps weren't able to before there are some challenges with social media as well in, in terms of um stress really in, in the sense that i know certainly when i was younger when there were stresses at school for example it would end to some extent at the end of the school day but with you know the rise of social media and the prominence of it 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 often can extend beyond sort of um school hours actually to to um seep into people's and young people's time when they're away from school as well um but I think it is important to say that coronavirus itself has created an additional stressor for, for our young people, um, whether that's the implications of lockdown and young people not being in school and, um, you know, learning in the way that they're used to or having their social interactions in the same way they would have done. Um, or actually, even whether it's just the stress of coronavirus itself, um, you know, I think uh, we need to appreciate that young people are really aware of what's happening around the world. Obviously, it depends on the age of, of a child, but I think we'll often be surprised about how uh, how much they are aware of, of difficulties. I, I have children myself and my three year old daughter is, you know, aware of masks and the word coronavirus and hand washing and, and so forth. So, you know, it is something that even our most, you know, our youngest children will be aware of. And um, they may not be as uh, conscious of what those stresses might be that it might might bring on. But it, I guess it's just something for us to be conscious of that that could be about you know, relate to anxieties of young people going out to social events again um, or going back into an education environment or even seeing their loved ones, which they've been told for a really long time they've not been able to do because of the risks associated with coronavirus. So there's some really unique, unprecedented stresses that our young people are experiencing at the moment. But, you know, there is I think the message is that there is hope and there is light at the end of the tunnel. Um, whether that's in relation to rates just generally coming down or the the rise of va the vaccination program as well. So that is something that is important to also share with with our children, young people, that there is actually a, a positive on the horizon that things will be that things will hopefully be changing soon. But I, I know we heard a little bit about how stress can present and and that well actually a lot about how it can present in very different ways from the NHS website and the Ayurvedic um, uh, principles too and I didn't want to do too much about this because it's so wide ranging uh, I, I mean clearly how um, how it can present would depend a lot on the age of a child a younger child would present uh, their stress levels in in quite a different way to um, to a child that's in their adolescence um, you know and I guess it can there can be things like physical effects that we've already heard that can occur you know even in younger children where they're commenting about uh, you know an upset stomach there can be children who are sort of bedwetting again who may not have been wetting the beds for quite some time um, <clears throat> but it, you know they there are as they, as young people get a bit older um, they are much more able to express themselves, whether they're aware of, of the feeling stress isn't that matter altogether, but they could be sort of increased anxiety difficulties that they might be expressing um, or um, increased sort of low mood difficulties or sadness or tearfulness. Um, and also behaviours of children, which sometimes is, is often the focus for for everyone really if we have a child who's going into school and they're getting into behavioral difficulties or altercations with their peers or they're getting into trouble of fights that they wouldn't have been at all before it's, it's not unusual for for everyone in the network involved with a young person to to be focusing a lot of their time and attention on those behaviors of well, how how can we stop those behaviors how can we stop them sort of misbehaving in class and not paying attention or you know um getting into fights with 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 kids or talking back to teachers or even outside of the school setting you know not listening to to parents or, or loved ones and family members and sometimes it's important to try and take a step back and think about well actually maybe this is 
this is a byproduct of stress that they might be experiencing because of um, you know, a variety of difficulties that we've touched upon. But why does it matter? Why does stress matter? And um, I think the reason it matters for us working with young people is related to, to what's on the screen in terms of the rise of mental health difficulties. Now, I wouldn't say that's purely related to, uh, to stress alone, but certainly increased levels of, of stress for young people will have an increased likelihood of them having the potential develop, to develop further difficulties with their mental health, which we already know is an increasing problem. I mean, even in these statistics themselves, uh, the one from the BBC in 2016 of uh, one in 10 children aged 5 to 16 having a diagnosable condition, we know that that's probably not accurate anymore. And even this, you know, the, the most latest of one in eight, we know that that's, that's very quickly moving in a trajectory where there are in, an increasing number of young people presenting with a variety of mental health difficulties. Um, and that's, I guess, why there's a lot of uh, initiatives nationally for us to be trying to put in support early, um, <clears throat> whether that's through specific supports within a school environment or services adapting the way in which they work to try and put a bit more of a focus on early intervention. So not necessarily just targeting young people who already have <clears throat> established signs and symptoms of a mental disorder, but also trying to work early with the young person and family to identify some of these emotions that are difficult and challenging for young people and develop ways in which collectively um, they can be managed more effectively so they, they prevent uh, a further development of, of an established mental health difficulty in the future. And just very quickly, how to help. I mean, a lot of it is it overlaps a lot with with um, with how you would look after yourself. But I think that's an important starting point, actually, that for for caregivers, be them parents or grandparents or whoever it might be, it's really important, actually, if you want to be helping other people, that you also make sure you focus on helping yourself. So, um, you know, dealing with any stresses that you might have in the first place is going to be vitally important. The more able you the more sorry you feel um able to manage your own stress the more you're able to kind of also support and manage um the stress of other young people some really basic things are still really vitally important rest is really important for young people making sure they have a good amount of sleep um that can we know that that has a direct impact on their stress levels as does having a good balanced diet so having a really um nutritious balanced diet will have a really positive impact on on stress levels i think the really the, the other really key points are time and communication so making time to be able to speak to our young people ab about the things that they're feeling stressed about and i think when i was thinking about this there's sort of a couple of points that came to my mind firstly um you know stress is relative so um when uh, you know I, I remember when i was sitting exams or end of year exams when i was a school student um you know it felt like the most important thing in the world at the time and actually it probably was you know that's where it's sort of it's it's relative to what's happening in that young person's life and it's only i guess when when we're older that we have the benefit of hindsight to reflect and appreciate actually you know what is perhaps more stressful events in their life and less stressful events in their life so i think that's the first thing to say that it's relative for you know for all young people a six, a six well an 18 year old a 17 year 18 year old will be do, doing their a level exams and will be thinking back to their gcse's even and say well that wasn't the most stressful thing in my life this is now the most stressful thing in my life so um you know so that's the first thing and I think when I'm when we talk about time and communication, I think it's really important to hold a curious stance. And what I mean by that is that often when we try and communicate with young people and, and not even just young people, but communicate generally, we often come at it with preconceived ideas ourselves about what would be what would constitute 
you know, a stressful situation, what would not? And whilst we might have our own views, which are based on our own personal life experiences, holding a curious position is, is really important when trying to communicate with, with young people in general. The young people that I see who have really positive outcomes, the, 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 uh, the commonalities often a sense of feeling understood. And that comes from um, having a curious stance therapeutically obviously that is part of the work that happens when someone is having sort of individual therapy so to speak that the therapist would have a very curious stance if I want to try and understand things with you but that extends out actually beyond just what happens from a professional setting and something that we encourage um, our young people and families to do actually when they do even when they do some family therapy based work to hold a curious position to try their best to see whether they can understand a young person um, and, and actually hear from them directly about any concerns that they might be having or things that, that they feel might be causing them to feel stressed. And the key to that is putting a, a, aside a good amount of time to be able to, be able to do that. Um, and I thought I'd just put a very last sort of slide just about some contacts and advice lines. There's, there's, there's a lot <clears throat> of, um, of phone numbers that people can call um, for additional support, whether that's for some more urgent support, like there's a, a, a we have a CAMS crisis line, which is open to the public. You don't have to be someone who's known to mental health services to call that crisis line. Clearly, it's a crisis line, so it is designed for those really crisis situations. But there are other things that people can access if they feel, um, you know, to, tr to try and help young people manage stress. You know, we've heard about Ayurvedic principles already today but you know very similar to that using mindfulness is is something that is really evidence-based to help in a lot of um in a lot of different ways and and support a variety of different mental health difficulties actually so that would expand beyond just not just only diagnosable mental health conditions but helping with things like stress and headspace is, is a good starting point um, for people. I think now actually for those who have Netflix subscriptions there is also some Headspace episodes on Netflix that people can access as well so because I know the Headspace app has a certain number of free sessions that people can access and it's very user-friendly for young people to be using too but if you know I know young people use a lot of Netflix as well there is actually some dedicated uh, talks on head on uh, on Netflix for Headspace as well, if people wanted to access it through that through those means. So that's that, that's that's me. Just a quick whistle stop tour about things. Oh no, thank you so much, Dr. Rao. It's it's brilliant. It really really useful. And I do think um, it, it it actually did yeah make me think how how early on the stress can start for us actually. So. Um, no, I really appreciate that. Thank you. So we have already got some questions in the chat, um, but just to let everyone know that obviously, um, please feel free to, um, you can either put up your hand sort of literally, physically, if I can see you on the screen, but you can obviously put up your hand through the little reaction Zoom button as well, where it just says raise hand. Um, and then um, you can of course write your questions into the chat function as well. So um, I know that, um, Yen, I can see that you've put a question in the chat. Are you all right to um, verbalise it as well? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm muted. Hi, Lizzie. Hello, hey. everyone. <laughs> um, yes, so a question for Dr. Rao. You mentioned about um, involving schools um, to identify or to spot um, some of these, yeah, the stress and depression, I imagine, is in there as well. Um, but I've come across many situations where they're actually not mm. aware and able to help. Mm. Could you expand on how either CAMS is involved in contacting schools or how um, they can be educated further? And then I also added in social services as well, because they're frequently in touch with families mm. um, through the generations as well. Mm. Um, that it all links up that has an effect on, you know, physical, mental health yeah. and um, going forward, yeah. Yeah, no, very happy to expand on that. And it's a great question. Um, <clears throat> so I think first thing to say is that schools should have access in themselves to things like school counselling support. So um, that, that 
that has been quite an established thing for quite some time that schools have access to a counsellor that they can um, use for support for young people if they if they identify it. But I guess your question is, you know, what initiatives are there to identify that support early? So the government um, a few years ago came up with a, a national initiative in relation to schools and children's mental health to move towards, well, how can we recognise some of these difficulties earlier, really? whilst also acknowledging that school teachers are already under a huge amount of pressure to essentially hold lots of different roles in mind. You know, there are educators, there are safeguarders, there are, you know, so I think it was, it was thinking, how do we do that? And there's, so there's been a national rollout in specific sites. Actually in Croydon, we do have what, we are one of what's called a trailblazer site where we have multiple schools where, which are linked in with CAMS where we have a, a, what's called a mental health schools team. And what they do is they work with teachers. Part of their work is about working with teachers to help educate them about mental health difficulties and how to identify some of those signs and symptoms early so that they're not developing into fully established mental health diagnoses. Mm. And part of that is also to offer low grade um, support to young people. Now, what I mean by that is not someone who has like a diagnosed depression or an anxiety disorder that needs more specialist support but actually you know people who are having self-esteem issues and you know mood difficulties or some worries that are a lower degree that if they're not tackled could you know could potentially develop into something more significant so there are teams that have been developed and Croydon is not just it's not the only site as I said it's a national initiative actually to try and help support schools um, to you know, understand mental health difficulties more, um, identify them earlier, and also try and support young people um, in, in within the school environment. And the way that they're supposed to work is, and the way that they are working is that they're linked in with the local child and adolescent mental health service, so that if um, this 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 uh, clinician is working with a young person, thinks, you know, what I think this needs to to actually go to a more specialist team for input <clears throat> it's supposed to um feed into the, the the cam service so it kind of helps with that transition so that there's not a need for another referral and and further weights and so forth um and and i think the last thing i'd add about yeah. schools is that even those young people who are known to mental health services we regularly have contact with schools <clears throat> so um, and and often you know we work in a really collaborative way to help support young people um, in an education environment and the same would apply for social services actually that um, for those young people who are known to social services we would um, work really collaboratively with them I do know that the social social care team are also looking at ways in which they could internally sort of develop their structures to be able to be more mindful about some of the what we would think of a sort of systemic effects of, of, of some of the difficulties that they're dealing with so how it impacts on the family and so forth and how they can support families as well. Okay thank you. Could I just also add so you mentioned about the um, the particular course that's been implemented for the schools the support. Are you saying that it's for teachers directly? So the ones who will actually have the contact with the children or would it be like the SEND team or just headmasters that then filter that down to the teachers? Yeah, um, I, I, so so the, the kind of initiative is for these mental health in schools teams to be created and we have that in Croydon. Um, and what happens is that those clinicians so they are mental health clinicians they would go to the schools and provide educational sessions with with the, with teachers I don't I couldn't tell you the specifics of whether it's just the Senco teachers or just the headmasters I think it's a bit broader than that in terms of um, the teachers that they do sessions with certainly during for example the coronavirus pandemic um, the, the team is, it has adapted a little bit to have like a telephone consultation line that teachers can call if they needed some support of knowing how to, to, to help their young people in their schools really. So it's not necessarily a course that teachers would go on for, for a certain period of time. It would be more that actually there'd be a few educational sessions to, to kind of support 
teachers in understanding mental health difficulties and how to recognize them early mm, i think it's the recognizing of yeah. the um yeah, of the yeah, we're certainly not expecting teachers to become therapists as well. That's not the expectation. It's more how can you recognise these things early so that the support can be put in place at an early an early stage. OK, thank you. Welcome. Yeah. Thanks for your question as well, Yen. Um, Kat, I saw that you've put a question in the chat. Are you able to um, ask your question? Yes, I'd love to. Um, and this is so interesting. I have to talk to you all day. Um, I've got a question, I've got a few, well I've got a million, but the first one is, um, what's the difference between anxiety and stress? If you've got a child or an adult, how would you differentiate between the two? I don't know if Claire and Matthew you wanted to, do, I don't know whether you had views on that from, from your perspective, first of all. No, go ahead. Um, I mean, I guess, I, I, I guess uh, for, from, from a mental health perspective, um, you know, I think stress would maybe be considered the precursor to anxiety in some respects, um, in that there are there are situations that you can feel stressed about, but it doesn't necessarily lead to to anxiety difficulties. And you know, if we if we break down what anxiety is, it's is related to worries. Um, and you know, when when I see young people with anxiety, um, we kind of break it down as what are the thoughts related to, to worries? So what are the things that you're worrying about? So your sort of thought processes and often what physical symptoms might be associated with it. So people who have anxiety difficulties can often get, you know, their heart racing, they can feel their, their breathing quickly or they can be shaky, um, which wouldn't necessarily be occurring when you're having stress, if you see what I mean. So yeah. I, I would say uh, for me, and I, Claire and Matthew disagree. You know, please sort of say otherwise if you feel, if you feel differently. But I wonder whether I would think of stress as a bit of a precursor to anxiety. Um, you know that, that you can have lower levels of stress that don't necessarily build up to an extent where you can become anxious about something. Um, but often, when you're anxious, when anxiety occurs, there is stress associated with it, whereas it might not be the other way around. If that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's really useful. Thank you. Um, Lizzie, can I ask one more question? Have I got time? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing I'm, I'm desperately curious about is I'm quite um, extrovert and outgoing and my daughter's slightly more introvert and I'm never sure whether that's a confidence and a stress issue or if it's personality. Mm. Um, and I've spoken to a lot of school mums and, and they've, they've got the same concerns. They're not sure whether their children have stress and anxiety or whether it's just their makeup. Yeah. Um, is there an easy way to tell? <laughs> yeah, um, for, for, uh, I guess the first thing I'd ask is how old is your daughter, if you don't mind sharing? Nine. Nine, okay. Well, yeah, so, um, I mean, with respect to personality, we know that sort of personality actually takes uh, quite some time to develop. So, um, you know, people's personalities aren't really established until they're in their late teens, early 20s, actually. Um, now, that doesn't mean that, you know, elements of personalities don't start developing earlier, of course, you know, and I'm not saying you can mould someone's personality when they're eight, nine, ten, to the way that you want it to be. Obviously, they start developing their own sort of persona and their own sort of likes and dislikes and so forth. But you know, I think personality is a, is a, a uh, something that develops over a prolonged period of time, is what I would say. Um, and it, so, it's a really interesting question. There's not a really clear way of sort of determining whether or not it's someone's personality or stresses they might be having. I think I would say it goes back to communication really so if 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 our young people are stressed and, about something i think it's about talking about it and talking about it in as i said that that taking that curious stance of really wanting to understand what might be going on for them will help uncover things a little bit in some ways because i guess you know if if someone is you know being a bit shyer and a bit more introverted it could be because there are underlying things and and i think sometimes we run we run in danger of over pathologizing things and what i mean yeah. by that is sort of like we kind of think oh okay well someone's not the way that we expect them to be so therefore there must be something that's wrong um 
and so I think it's a really important question that you've asked. It could just be her personality as she develops. And the, the unfortunate truth behind some of these things is time is, only, is sometimes the thing that will, will uncover those, those, those things really for you. But um, I think in the first instance, if you're curious, and if you're if you're wanting to if you communicate in a curious way, I think that might uncover things for you and help make you sort of some make some sort of distinction as to whether or not it's well she's just an introverted personality or is there something else that might be going on for them. Brilliant, thank you. Um, my last tiny question. Sorry, <laughs> tiny. Um, do you have any books to recommend to read to support on this? Um. Oh gosh, about uh, I don't there's, I don't have anything that suddenly springs to my mind about stress for young people. But there's a um, market there. <laughs> there is, there is, and I'm sure it's already flooded with with <laughs> with literature. It's just there's something that that doesn't because I guess for me working in in a mental health service, I guess we are, a lot more of our attention is on sort of diagnosed mental health difficulties rather than um, you know the literature that might be there for very much earlier on in that process of stress and stress management so there's not any books that immediately come to my mind i'm afraid sorry okay. no worries thank you thank you so much <laughs> thanks Kat. um so i'm passing over to jay um who's very patiently been waiting with a with a question for a while so please go ahead jay thank you thank you lizzie uh can everybody hear me yes yep. okay. Dr. Rao, I would have answered Katrina slightly differently. I would have said, take that curious position, ask your daughter what's wrong with mother, rather than <laughs> mother worrying about her. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think that's part of communication. I totally agree with you. I think you need to have a, a, an honest conversation of asking, rather than personally be worried, ask somebody else, what are you worried about me? Mm -hmm. I might, might bridge the gap a little bit, but anyway. Um, Thank you very much for your presentations. I'd like to thank Claire and uh, Matthew as well. Um, it is frightening to see the numbers, as you suggested, one in eight. Mm. Um, and at an early age, what I'm worried about from where I sit in ARCC is the growing problem as they get older and become more riskier. And then the cost, obviously, to the NHS and, and in terms mm -hmm. of the provision of the services. So my my question is related to what you said earlier about um, the link between the schools and camps. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel probably it's the right approach now to get the same type of link to a family type of group where parents and parents can be involved? And what's important in that scenario is because of the different differences in the culture, in, the, in your background, the family groups and so on. And I feel sometimes it is very important because there are certain communities where they have a peer type of structure, the children might be very hesitant about talking to their parents if you yeah. like. Um, so I think I would personally like to see what your, what your comments are on creating something like a family group. Yeah, I think, I think it's a really valid point. Um, I think the reason, um, that schools were sort of targeted was because of of the ease of getting a breadth of message, and you know even historically there have been other initiatives to look at um, to look at how to target younger children about learning emotional language and about talking about emotional well-being, yeah. um, and sort of trying to put it at the forefront of people's minds in the same ways that we we be starting to do about physical health, um, you know that that actually having a language for our emotional well-being is, is really vitally important and I think that's why schools have been targeted in the first instance because it is about educating as well and, and increasing that, that understanding and knowledge for young people. I think your point about families is a really um, really interesting one. I think a, a lot a lot of the service I mean certainly us in CAMS we do a lot of work with the families unquestionably. Um, I'd say the vast majority of our work you know outside of you know doing an individual piece of work with a young person would absolutely be about how to support the family and how to help communication within the family setting. I also know that our partner agencies um, do similar pieces of work as well. If I'm not mistaken, um, some of the local counselling services can offer some family-based kind of support as well. I think the only thing I would say 
with the challenges of of doing something that's sort of more targeted towards families is that th there are such uh, as you sort of alluded to already there's such a wide variety of how families are structured yeah. and so how you would create some sort of system or service that is able to target more families really is, is going to be tricky simply because you know there are there are multiple differences between families in terms of how they are set up how they're structured um as you've already alluded to the cultural differences of of how you know prominent people within the family are 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 viewed by younger people and feeling able to talk about them so it's it's, it's much more, i think it had to be a bit more of an individualized kind of approach really but but i do think you know something that looks at trying to uh increase the understanding and and um you know language again even for 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 maybe different generations would be useful as well because i'm you know being an asian man myself i'm conscious of my older generations whilst they're really aware of of mental health difficulties and there's an increasing appreciation of it it is still something that some some people from uh from different generations can sometimes find a little bit more of a challenge to to understand as well so maybe something around that would p potentially also have a, a an impact on on the wider family and how they would communicate to you yeah i think it's it's for them to do, take that previous position as you mentioned mm. in terms of making sure that the child feels understood more absolutely than, more than um you understanding him yeah in the case. absolutely um, but it would be something very useful to take mm. into consideration because I was very really sad to hear the story of Maya. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something that we really need to address mm. with either as a community that we can support um, because <clears throat> we, we, we are desperately trying to bring the communities together as much as we can with the support mm. services we will provide for our sisters. So mm. thank you very much for that. Very Thank well. you, Jay. Thank you. Um, so um, I'm aware that obviously quite a lot of the questions have been around around young people. So I'm just going to pass to um, Gladys because hers is um, um, a, well, it's actually about her sort of work situation. Are you all right to ask your question, Gladys? Hey, yes, yes, I am ready. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Go ahead. Um, well, um, I just got a new job and I would like to know how can I avoid the stress because my boss she was without um without the staff for a couple of months and i realized that she's very very stressed every time she talks to me um i can feel <laughs> her stress so i am every time i feel uh, that my hands start shaking and i can't stop that feeling um and i want to avoid the pressure from her is there any methods or something I could do to avoid the stress from her. Thank you. Um, do you want to um, answer that, um, Claire or Matthew? You want to have a go, Claire? If I can say something. No, go for it. <laughs> okay. Um, wow. It's tricky. But, um, one of the things I've learned about a lot in the past is, is, uh, is an approach called acceptance and commitment um, and it's it's like when we experience those sensations like the um, shaking or, or or tension in the muscles just noticing that and um, being aware of it and then giving yourself a chance if you can just to take a moment to take a few breaths I mean this is really really minimal but it's at least it and it, it what what can happen i think is we can add to our stress by feeling like we need to not experience those things there's a practical aspect which is uh, maybe to do with communication with with the um with the manager and those kind of things and, and and on the practical level but in terms of our own experience of the shaking and those direct physical experiences we can um we can have a, a kind of attitude of it's like a mindful attitude of 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 just noticing and and being willing to experience the sensation and then maybe take a breath allow yourself to just experience what's there take a breath to to just breathe into it and then and then maybe it'd be more possible to see something we can do practically whether that's to stand up for a few moments 
maybe maybe even if you get the chance just to get some fresh air just in, in that moment um there's there's a tendency to try to fight with with those, those experiences to not experience them and that can actually put, put us in more of a fighting mode which is in, going to then increase stress further potentially so there's this kind of approach of willingness to experience those sensations and on the other hand there's the commitment to re remembering why we're in the workplace what what our values are why we well why we're there in the first place um whatever those reasons are and and, and then um and then th there's the practical issues that which it's impossible to really understand from just you know that brief question but um yeah, hopefully that's useful in some respect. It's just the battle itself can sometimes add to that. So, yeah, um, but it's a kind of mindfulness-based approach. So that might be something to consider. Hopefully that's useful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Um, is Claire or Dr. Rao, is there anything you want to add? Um, you might have some little tips or tricks on how to uh, not let someone else's stress come onto you, really. I think it's important to treat yourself with loving kindness and be good to yourself and not be too harsh. Okay. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I would agree. I don't think I can. I think it's it's a really tricky situation, isn't it? And and I think, um, you know, I, I think Matthew alluded to it in terms of communicating with them is has a potential to be useful, but obviously we don't know your individual circumstances. So, you know, I agree it's about controlling the, to some extent it's about controlling the things that you can control or you have more control over. So I would, I would very much agree with what has been said. All right. Thank, Thank you so you. much, everyone. <laughs> Thanks, Gladys. Um, so um, we are coming up to quarter past. And um, so I'm going to let Dudley take the honour of the, the last question of the day. Um, and then we'll go on to um, our expert patients programme. So Dudley, no pressure, but it better be a good question. <laughs> oh, this is, don't worry, it's great. Listen, uh, thank you very much um, for invite, well, for being allowed to speak. Um, I missed some of the session, but one thing I wanted to raise, um, I've been involved with a programme presently with SLAM for mental health um, and wellbeing in, in social care and healthcare in the sector. And um, what we found is that, and one of the things I've looked at is the, the stigma and the notion of the word mental health and how it's affected being used, especially with people, the diverse community. And it's been quite a struggle to get around that. And what we found was really trying to get around the challenges of understanding that things such as stress, anxiety, depression, all play part and parcel of that. And I think one of the sectors which have been challenged mostly, most heavily during this period is those in social care and being on the front line and really looking how they've sort of coped and dealt with it. The question is, is and what we found is what works for one doesn't always work for another. And a lot of people are looking for answers. One of the things that I want to sort of um, really sort of explain is that, you know, it's a ticking time bomb with mental health and sort of well-being over the next six months and all the resilience that have been asked from those on the front line is really may just burst and pop and really finding things in place and how for them to find a place to go to, um, where to be signposted. It's really looking at of where to go and how to move forward from here. And I think that's one of the things I'm looking at or what we've looked at and we create a program and a portal specifically around that as well, which you think is really great. So I would want to see what your sort of take would be on. And so this is for those in the workforce, but we also deal with those, the elderly and as well, those who, the people that we care for as well. I hope that question is good enough anyway. Thank you, Dudley. Um, um, Dr. Rao, do you want to start? Yeah, so so to just to clarify, Dudley, it's sort of you're looking at support for people within the the workforce. Is that what you're yes, sort of saying? Indeed. Yeah, I think it's I think you're absolutely right. I think you're absolutely right. I think you know we've already been seeing signs of people on the front line really struggling with their mental health difficulties as a result of the pandemic. Um, you know, and 
it's something that it, mental health services as a whole are bracing themselves for. Um, you know, when the when the coronavirus started, um, you know, we we kind of had this mantra that our wave is later. You know, our wave happens after all of the the dust has settled with with the actual illness itself. So, um, and you know, unquestionably, with how things have been over the last twelve months, there'll be certain people on the front line who will be at the forefront of needing some support with their mental health needs. And you know, I, I would say probably not always the best at coming forth about needing support as well. So. I think I think it's a great initiative to try and make it more accessible. I think when you know when whatever profession you might be in, whether it's in healthcare or social care or the police or whatever, there are so many people who've been in the front line in, in various different ways um, that I think trying to make these things as accessible as possible is is vitally important. And I I completely agree with your point about um, stigma and and language actually and i think you know there's uh, th there's been a drive towards talking about mental well-being and emotional well-being so that there's not this stigma that has been attached to mental health as a terminology because obviously what we what we aim to be doing is as you're sort of describing trying to support people early so that they're thinking how can i make sure i'm looking after my mental well-being so that you know things don't worsen over time. So I think, yeah, I, I think it's a great, great idea, a really good initiative, and something that will be really welcomed by people that I know who have been working on the front line. Thank you. Um, do you have anything to add, sort of Matthew or Claire, and um, sort of you know around Dudley's question? I would just say that the just as another contribution, we just to mention that the courses at the Recovery College are available to staff and at the moment they're available to to everyone so um if anyone's interested in the courses we run there we are doing we mentioned that we were talking about ayurveda earlier we do various um courses relating to that including things like um learning how to apply self-massage which which some staff have attended and they found that really helpful and relaxing but yeah all the courses are available to staff and carers and to, to anyone that, that wants to to join and um, if you just look at the website, Recovery College website, you can, uh, yeah, all good. Thanks for sharing that, Liz, Lizzie. And um, yeah, and if anyone's got any suggestions about the kind of courses we could help run that would be um, useful to the people in this forum, let us know. But yeah. any, anything from Claire? No, and just, just to, to reiterate, we, it's not just SLAM, patients and staff who can come. At the moment, anybody, you don't need to have a connection with SLAM. Thank you, that's really useful. I know that um, a lot of uh, the health champions that um, I'm working with as part of the Asian Resource Centre, we've been sending them to the, the Recovery College courses and Yen's actually just put in the chat there that's saying that they're brilliant and um, they're so varied. You can pretty much do anything. I'm amazed at what the Recovery College can offer. So please do look at the website. I've just put it into the chat function for everyone. Um, so I did say Dudley, yours question was the last, but then I noticed that Emma's put up her hand and well, Emma's the CEO of the Asian Resource Centre, so I can't really say no, can I? So go ahead, Emma, you can be the last one. <laughs> Thanks very much and apologies um, that, that you've given me that privilege and I'll, I'll just be very, very quick. Um, my question was really a personal concern around um, a family member of mine who, um, a child who's been getting various types of therapy since she was what in year four or something quite young and getting counseling now she said something to me that kind of really made me think she said I just want answers I don't want to talk so um, with counseling it's a lot of talking and I was wondering if coaching is a better method for for young people in in terms of finding solutions not just talking because where they are in a loving environment within the home sometimes the problem is outside um, popularity all sorts of things that the body image all sorts of things that we're facing um, young people with nowadays um, <clears throat> And, and so it's, it's really difficult for the family to support a child where they feel like they're being as loving, as caring, as sort of supportive as they possibly can, but actually don't know how to professionally help 
this um, this child who's growing and going through puberty and the and the rest, but it very definitely needs some sort of therapy or or intervention. So my 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 question really is around coaching versus counselling. I guess. Thank you. Yeah, it's a really interesting one. Um, I mean, what I would say is I don't have um, much experience about coaching. I don't have any experience about coaching for young people, if I'm going to be completely honest with you. Um, you know, I, I guess what I would say is there there are so many parameters when it comes to a talking therapy being... Um, successful in inverted commas or not and I think one of the com one of the questions in the chat was also about how successful is 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 um counseling for young children and and the, I guess what I would say is that there are thousands of types of therapy there are literally thousands I, not even specifically for children young people I'm just saying just generally there are thousands of types of therapies with different therapeutic interventions working for, for different young people in different kind of ways and that's even before you start thinking about what the therapist is like and and you know therapy is about a relationship isn't it so you know, that relationship is really key for for progress to to be made what i would say is that counseling in general it is a bit more of an open space of someone being able to bring what they would want to the table so it is a bit more guided by um by for example in this situation a young person sort of bringing specific things that they would want to talk about so it's not necessarily one where you know um there are immediate answers that would come about but i guess the idea of it would be to help guide someone to be able to develop those answers themselves if that makes sense but um i do know that there are kind of initiatives of things like mentors which is i know mentoring is different to to, to coaching but there are some similarities and they often sort of share a lot of the, the ethos is so there is more of a that, that kind of approach for young people than than the coaching side of things um so it may be that something within that sphere like a mentoring kind of program or initiative might be more suitable than than a coaching one because i'm not aware of specific coaching i mean yeah there might be some things but it's because of working in the nhs in a mental health service it's not something that i'm that au fait with about coaching for young people specifically oh thank you very much um so we got a lot of lot of brilliant information there and i really appreciate the fact that everyone asked um some some really difficult questions actually i don't feel like you made it that easy for dr rao and um claire and matthew so <laughs> well done everyone um we are um, nearing the end of um, our session today. So we're just gonna do a very quick um, expert patients program. We've put that in today because it is um, available for people who are um, experiencing um, mental health issues as well as other long-term health conditions. And then please hang around because at the end, um, as with all of our virtual coffee mornings, we pull the three names from a hat, or in this case, a virtual um, sort of wheel of fortune. And then the people that are chosen, you will get a mini coffee hamper sent to you as if you were at a real coffee morning. So um, I will be as quick as possible with doing the expert patient program presentation. Um, and then of course you will have the much more fun part of possibly winning the coffee hamper. So um, this is something that's um, new to Croydon um, and it's run by the Asian Resource Centre and with the Croydon BME Forum. So you run it as a um, joint partnership and um, with um, the South West London CCG being our um, commissioning partners. And it is for anyone in Croydon, basically if you live in Croydon or you're registered with a Croydon GP, um, to help you personally manage a, a long-term health condition. And it is completely free. And currently it is um, running online for six weeks. Um, we are looking at particular things like diabetes, high blood pressure, um, respiratory issues. But like I said, it's absolutely available to people with um, mental health concerns, um, sort of anxiety, depression, um, stress. It's because the course is about um, how you self-manage, how you can improve 
for that yourself. And what is really important to know is that the course is also available to carers. So if you look after someone with a long-term condition, then you are most welcome to join as well. Um, it is designed to boost your own health and well-being. Um, we do a lot of things around sort of action planning, um, solutions for um, like you know problem solving. Um, a lot of um, give you skills to build up your confidence, not only for your for yourself, but also how you interact with others and how you interact with health professionals as well. Um, and it is important to know that it's um, completely complementary to care you already receive via the NHS. Um, so, you know, we really going to help you build up that rapport with your health professional. And, you, and everything that you receive through the course is completely free as well. So not just the course is free, but any resources that we send to you are, they just, they arrive beautifully in the post magically. Um, so we have six sessions um, and each session covers completely different topics. So we don't repeat anything. So we, we try and encourage you to attend all six weeks. And we deal with everything around a long-term condition. So um, obviously each condition is different, but we deal with the sort of general things that can affect you. So things like pain and tiredness. Um, we do the positive side as well, like with the healthy eating and um, sort of movement and exercise. And we give you um, strategies, which is very appropriate for today um, about managing stress as well. Um, it, the course itself, although it's new to Croydon currently, um, was actually, it's been around for 30 years. And um, it, I always feel really lucky to be able to say that currently worldwide, it's the most researched course um, that exists. So there's a lot of um, um, sort of care and consideration and research into the course itself. Um, and hopefully, you know, you go away with a lot of new skills and confidence. So the things that I always get asked, do I have to pay? No, nope, it's absolutely free. Do you need to be referred? No, you can be, of course, if, if you had a link worker or a doctor that wants to refer you, that's no problem, but you can just self-refer. You literally just send in the form. And the course is for two and a half hours each week for six weeks. And that's on Zoom at the moment. And obviously two and a half hours is a long time. So please be reassured that there's plenty of breaks included as well. The course, um, each course, no matter what you go on, will always be co-tutored by two people. And those um, tutors will have a personal experience of living with a long-term condition. So they will be able to relate with you um, about your experience. The courses are currently running. Our first courses, one and two, are currently going ahead, full steam. And then these are our next two courses that if you're interested, when you could join. So it will be either on Tuesdays for six weeks or on Wednesdays for six weeks. But like I said, it will run throughout the whole year. So if you can't make these ones, no stress, just drop me an email. And that's the contact details. So I'm Lizzie, I work for the Asian Resource Center and um, there's our number and email, but I'll also put it into the chat for you. And Melissa is my really lovely colleague who works at the Croydon BME Forum and she's my co-coordinator. So I tried to do that as fast as I possibly could for you. So if it wasn't too, um, too laborious because now we get the, the fun parts. I'm gonna to pass to Naeem who is gonna do our pulling out the three names of winners, hopefully. Uh, yes, um, it's ready to do that. So let's see who's the first winner. Oh, <laughs> okay, <so>. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Jay, I can't believe you won. <laughs> I feel like maybe it's a, as the chairman of ARCC, I'm like, did Naeem, did he uh, <laughs> manipulate this wheel? <laughs> uh, no, it's, I've got nothing to do with it. Let me just, <laughs> I, I would like to donate this, um, the prize to somebody that has given us some useful information today. Um, right. So I would love to give it to, sorry, Matthew and Claire, it's not nothing against you, Mike, but Dr. Rao, you, you're welcome to take that present from me. Oh, so Dr. Hey. Rao, that basically that means you're going to have to send me your, your address in the chat privately <laughs> so I can send it to you. Sure. Okay. 
Sorry, I realised I was muted. Thank you. That's very, very kind of you. <clears throat> right, so next person. Good morning again. Um, if you are in the, um, still in the meeting, please email me or contact me and I will take your address and I can post you the mini coffee hamper. Yes. Thank you. I'm just I'm writing down my email And um, phone number in the chat so you can call me or just drop an email with your address and I can post that bit. Right, next person. <laughs> well you've worked hard today so that's good that you get a prize for it yay <laughs> right that's all three i've got so yes well done to everyone who won something and yeah it's really nice in that actually cool. naeem can i just ask can you put your email address in the chat yep, so that um Claire, Marion, and um, Dr. Rao can send you their addresses for the hamper? Yep, absolutely. I'm going to drop my email and the phone number. You can message me or just uh, drop the email. Cool. Thank you. All right. So we're nearly at the end. So you made it. Um, Mamun's just going to let us know um, what events we've got coming up next. Um, and then we'll go ahead. Firstly, our next virtual coffee morning will be on Wednesday, the 5th of May, uh, same time, 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Uh, the theme for that is hypertension awareness with Dr. Aku Nuri. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. So please do join us for that and put it into your diary. Um, we have an event coming up tomorrow. Um, some of you will know that we are the local trusted organization for a big local broad green. So uh, we are holding the virtual annual meeting tomorrow between 4 p.m. to 5.30 p.m. You must register for this in order to get the invite link uh, via Eventbrite. So you can go to the biglocalbroadgreen.co.uk website and sign up. Or alternatively, you can go to ARCC website, which is arcctd.com um, and do register if you'd like to attend and know more about Big Local Broad Green and plans for the future. Um, and what we've been up to basically during lockdown um, over the past year and how we supported the community with various initiatives um, happening directly from the hub. Um, I haven't got the flyer for um, a dance therapy session that we're starting on Monday from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. It's not quite ready. So if you are interested in dance therapy, please do um, give Naima a call or email him. Um, if you have signed up to a database, you will receive the um, flyer shortly. So that's something that we're starting very shortly as well. So yeah, that's all for now. Thank you very much for joining us uh, this morning. Nice Brilliant. session. I'll pass it back to Lizzie to conclude. Thank you, Mumun. I think it's just uh, saying thank you to Dr. Rao and Matthew and Claire. Um, thank you so much. You guys answered loads of questions, did brilliant presentation. Um, and just a reminder to everyone that this will be put up on our YouTube channel. So if there was something on here that you thought would be useful for a friend or family member, please feel free to send them that link. But yeah, thank you, Claire. Thank you, Matthew. And thank you, Dr. Rao. And well done, Claire, for winning a hamper. <laughs> brilliant. All right, we'll see you next month. Bye-bye. Okay, Bye. -bye. Bye.